Hey, everybody, welcome. I'm Alex Steele. Join with some special guests, Karen Carneal Tambor and Karsten Stendevad. They're both co CIOs for sustainability over at Bridgewater. Guys, really appreciate you coming and doing this with us. And I think that the two of you together paint a really clear picture of how to think about investing sustainably. You know, Karen, you come with 15 years experience in Bridgewater and investing cycle. And uh, Karsten, you previously worked at a national uh, pension fund over in Denmark. So you're like sustainability is in your blood. Karen, tell me how you guys are fusing these two things. How's Bridgewater thinking about it? Well, you know, one of the easy, one of the early decisions we made at Bridgewater was that we weren't going to build some other sustainability function. We weren't going to say, you know, there's the real investors. And then over there, we have the sustainable investors that are going to show up after the fact and tell us we should be polluting less or something like that. We basically said, if we're going to look at this, it needs to be in our bloodstream the same way that most of the large clients that we work with are increasingly put it into their bloodstream. And so we basically said we need to fuse exactly as you said, both long time Bridgewater experience. I've been working at Bridgewater, you know, for 15 years, been serving in our investment committee, built a lot of our algorithmic understanding of markets with deep sustainability understanding. Karsten, you know, a leader in his field, uh, wrote a lot of the um, early codes and understanding in Denmark of how to do this long before a lot of us probably watching this uh, presentation right now even really thought about the word uh, sustainability with regards to investing and doing it across public and private markets at a huge depth and saying we're going to build that as a function that is both deeply within our investment process so that every time we look at an asset class and we're saying what's its return and what's its risk, we're just thinking whatever's pertinent to that asset. And if those happen to be you know, environmental or social issues, just whatever's pertinent to that asset. And at the same time, we're also going to build a new functionality to say, insofar as investors really care about sustainability as a first class consideration, we can also prioritize that goal alongside risk and return. Yeah, Carson, so so break that down a little bit. Um, is it that you have a big portfolio and a little bit is going to be sustainable or the whole thing is sustainable? Like, do I want returns or do I want to feel good? Like, can those coexist? I think they can coexist. But, you know, we approach uh, sustainability really from the starting point of who we are as investors. So Bridgewater, you know, is a macro investor. Um, and so the most important thing when it comes to sustainability is to think about how, how issues relating to social and environmental issues, um, the extent to which they affect all of our portfolios, the risk and return of all of, of our portfolios. So if you think of just about macro, uh, already now, um, there are a number of issues relating to social and environmental issues that are pertinent. Uh, if you want to have a macro understanding, uh, just think about fiscal and monetary policy already today is already driven by some of these issues. Uh, look at uh, fiscal policy and in a way the inherent almost redistributive nature of that and how that is often driven by and seeking to affect um, environmental and social issues. Look at today the announcement out of the EU around um, mm. a broad sweep of climate change initiatives. That's going to have clear impact on the macro economy, on capital flows, on investor behavior. So that's one part of what we do, just understanding how these issues affect macro. That's true for anything we invest in. And that we do in pursuit of um, the best risk-adjusted returns possible. But then increasingly, we are seeing a number of our clients uh, say to us, look, we don't just have financial objectives. We actually also have non-financial objectives. It could be a net zero uh, orientation. Uh, it could be other things. And there, what we've really spent a lot of time researching is the question of how can you build a portfolio that both delivers excellent financial returns, but where, where the security selection, where each security you have is also aligned to, for example, the UN SDGs. And that is really a new way of thinking about portfolio construction. Uh, ultimately, whether you have a portfolio that's just focused on risk and return or risk, return and impact, that's really up to asset owners. That's, it's, they are the owners of the assets. They determine the goals of, of the portfolios. But we basically are able to do both. Um, both take it into account in, in as far as it's relevant for risk and return, as well as build portfolios that have both risk, return and uh, impact objectives. So, Karen, give me some specific examples of something that makes sense in a portfolio based on all of this, like today, 
that might not have made sense, you know, five years ago? Well, good question. I think that uh, a really interesting spot where I love talking about because so many sustainable investors hate talking about it, so I like leaning into it, is thinking about commodities. Because on one hand, commodities are uh, very unsustainable. There's no commodity that you can't look at and talk about uh, things that are not going well and how that commodity is either produced or consumed. And so whether it is uh, using, um, you know, having uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the process of mining it out of the ground or mining it unsustainably with issues like child labor or slave labor, all the way to you know oil, when you burn it, that's when you're really warming the planet. That said, we feel that investors just saying, you know what, I don't want to be in commodities. There's bad things happening there is a very big mistake because when you kind of think, what is our vision of a sustainable world? It really requires commodities. There's, there's no vision of a sustainable world where you say we're going to have no more aluminum and no more steel and no more copper. And actually, if you want to transition away from carbon, you need more of those things, not less. You got to get a lot of copper and steel and aluminum and so on to build all those electric vehicles and rebuild our buildings and refurbish them to be green. You've got to actually do all those things. So we feel that as investors, you know, you uh, one can prioritize being in the commodities that are the types of commodities that make a difference in a sustainable future and getting out of the commodities that are the ones we need to phase out of, like coal and oil. Second, if you're doing it in companies, you can pick which are the ones that are doing it best. And then from a pure risk return perspective, I mean, to be blunt, I don't think anybody could say, what do I think is going to happen to the price of steel or copper without asking this question of what will happen to the pace of transition away from carbon? You, when you say, what is the supply demand going to be like? You have to basically ask yourself, well, how fast is the world going to choose to transition away? Karsten was talking about um, you know, the European Union putting all these climate initiatives. They're trying to accelerate people to move away from oil and coal. The faster you think it's going to happen, the more copper or steel we'll need. And so even if you don't care at all about sustainability, you've got to consider those things with regards to um, what do you think will happen to the supply demand? What will the price do? And then specifically mm -hmm. today, relative to five years ago, the risk of inflation has gotten massively larger. And so the need for inflation hedges is more important. So now you're looking at an asset class of let's call it metals, uh, even though you know steel and iron aren't exactly a metal, but you look at this whole class of things and you say, financially, this makes a lot of sense to me because I see the supply demand imbalance. From a risk perspective, risk of inflation is one of my biggest risks in the portfolio. And from a sustainability perspective, I want to pick you know, these commodities because they're what's needed for a more sustainable world. So quick follow on that. And then I definitely want to unpack uh, what the EU announced today also, because I think this fits obviously both in your wheelhouses. But Karen, if you take something like cobalt, for example, I know it's specific, but clearly that's huge in the EV battery market, right? And we're going to need the batteries in many different industries to make this transition work. But it's mm -hmm. mined in the DRC and there's not a lot of it. So like, how do you filter sustainability when there are just so many parts to it, right? Like copper's relatively cleaner when it comes to emissions, but like iron ore isn't. Like, so how do you think about the whole pie? Carson, you want to take that? Yeah, so I she think that cobalt one. She's is like, bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Cobalt is a great example because um, it's, an, it's a reminder that you have to look through the entire supply chain when you think about sustainability. So if you look at those beautiful electrical cars or other thing, uh, other other types of you know green infrastructure, a lot of it relies on cobalt, as you said. You mentioned the DRC, like a third of the um, cobalt mining is in are these artisanal mines with lots of child labor and other bad things. So ultimately, I think for an investor, what we are really trying to build out is a very systematic way of analyzing sustainability where as much as possible, we try to be to decompose a supply chain. Uh, like you look at a particular company, you would look at, to make it concrete, you look at products and services of the company and see, is that sustainable? But then really drilling in also to how these companies are operating and how what their supplies look like. Um, and one of the great news when it comes to sustainable investing is the very significant development of a whole new sustainability data system, uh, ecosystem that enables us to actually try to understand these issues better. And so, for example, thinking about really the provenance of where um, yeah, the supply chain, where the metal is coming from is important. But it's also fair to say that it's it's not this is not easy. We don't have perfect data, and sometimes there are also clear trade-offs. Meaning you have to go in and weigh. Okay, so we see the production, um, 
you know, how, how is that done? Is it uh, above the bar in terms of what we want from a sustainability perspective? And what will be the usage, usage of it? I think we will see much more focus on, when it comes to uh, sustainability and the environmental angle, one, I think, very important point is to consider not just the environmental aspects, but also this kind of the social derived um, consequences of it. So in a way, uh, modern slavery is an interest, is a horrible thing, and it's a often associated with some of these things that are needed for the green transition. So I think yeah. really having a this holistic view of not just the first order effect, but the second and third order effect, which often is deep in the supply chain. And just to build on what okay. he's saying, since I know I passed that off as a hard question, <laughs> I mean that um, I think our biggest strength coming to this is that a lot of these issues for investors, they're kind of hidden inside what you're buying. Because let me tell you, no one is coming to investors saying, please buy my company. I use slave labor to make cobalt. Nobody's going to tell you that. So it's not like an investor you're going to kind of see that written out. So when an issue like that comes up, I think the question is for investors, you know, no one's going to have the manpower to be like flying around the world and showing up in the DRC and tracking themselves where the cobalt's getting to. So we need to have investors like Bridgewater that have built years of experience taking huge, vast quantities of data and being able to process them and be able to kind of direct them and say what's really inside everything. And just like a Bridgewater can look at I don't know what's going on in Brazil and wrap that all the way through to which credit card receipts are we seeing in Brazil. We really need investors to be able to do the same thing to look at a company and say, actually, you're relying on cobalt that's coming from these mines. You need to change your supply chains in some way because no one's going to tell the investor that willingly saying, I'm really worried I have child labor sitting in these mines. And so applying that sort of data analytics, rigor and systemization to go from the concept of this is what I want in the companies I buy all the way to actually being able to see it, uh, we think is a really important part of the equation. So to that point, and I swear we're going to get back to the EU and, and behavioral changes and such, um, how, how does China then, how do you think about China? Because that is a very complicated market to begin with. And then you throw in sustainability and it gets even more complicated. Um, Bridgewater is big in China. So Karsten, like, what's the screen there? Like, how do you manage that kind of investment? So the way we would approach it, um, uh, the first question is, are we looking in portfolios that are, have a risk, uh, risk and return orientation or risk return and impact orientation? If it's the latter, where we will, for all securities, we would try to um, assess what is the, really the alignment to the UN SDGs at a very granular level. So the way we would evaluate, for example, a Chinese company is the same way we, we would evaluate any other companies in the world. We would look at the products and services of what they do, and we would look at how they do it. And so um, that's the assessment we would do. And so, for example, you, you might look at a company that does, let's say, recycling uh, of materials, and we would look at, okay, that's, a, that's an important, let's say, aligned um, activity to do for, for a sustainable future. And then you'd look at how they do it. I mean, you look at labor practices, you look at their environmental practices, all the other things, and ultimately we would make a determination. And um, so we will make that assessment the same way there that, as we would in any other place when it comes to uh, assessing the impact, if it's for our these impact-oriented uh, portfolios. And then in China, as well as in other emerging markets, uh, I think it's fair to say that making this assessment is still hard because the data is not as great as it is in other markets, although that is improving uh, rapidly. But ultimately, we would, do, we would try to apply the same process, not just across companies, but really across asset classes. And I think that's another important point we try to do which is, is really to have a kind of intellectually consistent framework across whether it's commodities like Karen just talked about, equities, fixed income, really all types of securities that you, you could invest in. So it's consistent across asset classes and across geographies. Karen, I'd love to get your take on that too. I think that as investors, the most important thing we need to accomplish on China is really a better data ecosystem. Because look, China is the second biggest stock market in the world, and there's a huge range of companies there. And so it's easy to point to uh, a lot of things happening in China that are very inconsistent with a sustainable future. But there are also a lot of great things that are happening there that are critical to a sustainable future. Some of the most innovative companies in the world are there. If you basically say, where are the innovation ecosystems where new things are being created that never existed before? 
it's, you know, it's Silicon Valley and it's China. And so as investors, we really want to be able to tap in to all the companies that are making goods and services that are going to contribute. And right now it's very hard to do that in China. A lot of companies, you know, they don't have a lot of work in English. They don't have a lot of transparency. And so our big push as investors is to say, you know, we would like to create the Chinese ecosystem to be as approachable and accessible to U.S. investors because we think it's huge and has a lot of possibilities. And that'll both shine a light at what needs improvement and give us access to a lot of the great things where we want to be really moving and providing capital um, and coming in as investors saying we want to be proactively giving capital to com companies mm -hmm. that are going to make a difference. On the flip side, do, does the shift, does the further shift in sustainability make some things uninvestable? And this is where I want to bring in what the EU did today in terms of their fit for 55. So they're super aggressive in terms of hitting some of their targets. A lot of that's going to come from the aviation sector. So planes that we're going to take in Europe, for example, uh, need to not use diesel. They need to use biofuels, big shift, uh, autos, same kind of thing. I mean, if you move too fast, Karen, like how do you invest in an airline when they're literally going to have to change their entire model in like 10 years? Like, are there things you just can't buy? Well, I think what's fantastic about what the EU is doing is that the policymakers really set kind of the guardrails and incentives that shift what companies need to be doing. And so investors can only do so much in saying, we'll make cost of capital cheaper or more expensive. We'll provide mm -hmm. you capital to do certain things. Regulators can accelerate that a lot by putting regulation in place that shifts it further. And so a lot of what the EU is doing is it's making the incentives for companies to go transition away from carbon much greater. Both carrots and sticks saying, you've got to go do this. And then as an investor, whatever is the regulatory framework, that, that's the background. It's sort of like, those are the rules of the game. That's what regulators have set up. And then as an investor, you want to support and reward companies that are going to be able to live up to that challenge. So I think there's a great setup in Europe for airlines for car companies to say, we have a plan that will have us, instead of suffering from these regulatory changes, actually you know, succeeding from them because we can do it, and that investors should be punishing companies that can't handle the new regulatory regime and can't make those shifts. Carson, what do you think? I think that's exactly right, that ultimately, as Karen said, there's only, investors can do a lot, and we have to lean into it. Companies, of course, can do a lot, but the we need the policy framework to create uh, the clarity around it. And so the, to the extent that this, um, these new EU rules, and hopefully followed by more, more global agreements on these, uh, these important topics, that's, it's just a helpful background for us investors to then go in, not just and understand uh, how this will play out, but also to invest and align capital to these sustainable um, outcomes. The reality is, if you just look at how much discussions and chatter there has been among investors, I guess, among, among the world community, around what will um, the implications of this tr uh, transition to a low carbon economy, what will they mean uh, in the near term and the long term? We're all researching it intensely, intensely. But the reality is, it's a hard question when there's such broad policy choices that are still unclear. Carbon tax, no carbon tax. Uh, a lot of the things coming out of EU today are, first of all, we don't exactly know whether it actually will be implemented still. Um, but if you don't have clarity on that, the range of outcomes is so broad. Um, as an investor, it's you really have to take into account a lot of diff different scenarios. And the more you can kind of narrow in the scenarios from a regulatory perspective, the easier it is for, for investors to allocate capital um, aligned with that. Well, especially when like different countries move at different paces and are more aggressive than others. Like that's got to be really complicated. Um, we have a question from an audience and I feel like I'm going to maybe go to Carson on this, but it might be better for Karen. So you, you guys can pick. Uh, does Bridgewater publicly take a certain stance on various ESG factors or outcomes? This example the viewer is talking about is a stance on palm oil or is it has to be an investment decision on a case by case basis? So uh, the... Uh, our overall approach to all of our investment systems is to try to first have a very our own fundamental understanding uh, of of issues, whether that's macro or whether it's sustainability alignment. So our first the first point is we try to come up with our own understanding of the issues, and we do that in a way that is as systematically as possible. So not case by case. We try actually to start at the high level of saying, you mentioned palm oil. We would actually start at a different place, which is. Let's think about commodities. How would we think about sustainability in commodities? Start with that conceptual framework. And then we would go out and build out a data, like, um, collect the data that we need to um, 
build out that picture and then really try to, like say the way we think about palm oil versus other, other commodities, it would be done like in a consistent, uh, consistent manner. And um, so I think that's, that, that's the, the first point. And what we do in terms of sustainability is really to try to use uh, alignment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals as our orienting framework. What's very important to us is we don't want this to be about our, uh, what we, what we, uh, our, our views on certain things. We want as much as possible to anchor to the UN SDGs. Why? Because that really represents the global consensus of a sustainable world. So if you take something like palm oil, we would, it would be part of our overall commodity assessment. And then we would see, okay, how do we think that aligns with overall U, uh, UN SDGs? And we would look at, again, how is it produced? Is it sustainable or not sustainable? And what is it used for? Karen, did you want to add to that or? Uh, just to emphasize that we really uh, believe in making those choices um, principled and transparent because we feel that too much in this space comes down to sort of personal opinion and that weakens the space. And so the more you feel like, you know, Bridgewater has an analyst that really feels strongly about X or the talk to this management team and got convinced about Y, the more you kind of say, this is a personal opinion issue, as well as I can't replicate it because I'm not gonna have a thousand analysts talking to everybody. What we really tried to do is on any decision like that, be able to kind of share these are, um, you know, the principles we're trying to put a play. Here's how we systematically measure them and triangulate those measurements and put that out there both so it's useful for others and it's more defensible and it isn't like Karsten and Karen's personal opinion on the topic. And mm -hmm. so, you know, Karsten said a commodity example with palm oil. You can look on our website and we have, you know, our paper that lines up every commodity market in the world on sustainability of production, sustainability of consumption, how we measure that, how we triangulate the data and therefore what we think the best and worst is and why. And hopefully that'll change and keep evolving over time and we want to put those things out there for that reason and any choice we make be able to say here's how we triangulated three four five pieces of data here's the type of questions we're asking and then here's what would make us change our mind that also makes engagement with the world a lot more principled because it's less like i have to impress and sound good to karsten or karen and more like this is what they're measuring this will determine if i'm in the portfolio and these are the things that will actually make a difference and just having the two of you with your experiences in those specific roles sort of really uh, highlights that. Um, a couple questions coming in. So I think you mentioned this earlier. This one question, I guess maybe for you, Karen, is do, well, or Carson, do you engage with management teams to try and affect behavioral change? Is that something that would be a mandate for Bridgewater or no? So really, uh, as part of our uh, these new portfolios where we seek to have this both risk of return and a sustainability impact, uh, we are and we will. Um, and the idea there is try to uh, engage constructively with companies um, with the starting point for us of our understanding or our assessment of whether a company is sustainable or not, and then having engagements with them on around issues that, um, you know, what we think uh, there is a potential for them to improve in some of these sustainability areas. Uh, so that's a, um, that, that's certainly part of uh, our overall sustainability effort. It's a topic that I feel, you know, I feel strongly about. I, you know, uh, in, in some of the Northern European countries, there's a very long history of this among the asset owners. Uh, I wrote the stewardship code uh, in Denmark, which really is about how institutional investors can do this. And one of the lessons I had from from then is, there's no one size that fits all for all investors. At the end of the day, to have constructive engagement with clients, uh, or sorry, not clients with uh, companies, um, you know, in my view is the more it is an ongoing, constructive, fact-based uh, dialogue, uh, the better. And then, of course, there's also the reality of, are you a large, long-term shareholder? Are you a small shareholder? I mean, all those things will dictate how these uh, engagements uh, will, uh, will proceed and how they can be most constructive. But clearly, corporate engagement is, uh, is an important part of a sustainability effort. So, Karen, this is the last question for you. It's a question from the audience. You sort of hinted at it with commodities, but the question is what are the themes around the corner, the issues, themes that investors should be thinking about? And I think it's a fun question for you because you can kind of fuse the macro investment perspective uh, with, sustainability, with sustainability. Absolutely. Let me say that I think that in some sense, everything on the environmental side is already kind of thought about in terms of there's no investor that hasn't figured out that Every government in the world has made a net zero pledge. And so the world's gonna to try to move away from carbon. It's kind of on everyone's horizon. When it comes on social, I think that's a lot more amorphous. 
And a lot of people mean different things when they talk about that. And investors are going to have to figure out what's actually important about social, what are actually the social issues that'll matter to their portfolio. And that's where I'd say, look to the Fed, look at what are the issues that US policymakers are saying, this is impacting my views on conditions. And so when I look at the unemployment rate and I'm the Fed, I'm not just thinking things are great. Part of the reason that the Fed really hopes inflation is transitory is that it's thinking, well, there's a lot of pockets of the employment market that are not doing so well. What is it talking about? It's talking about inequality, how you get the expansion to get to all the different parts of the country. And as that weighs on policymakers' minds, that's going to matter for investors. When you look at why Biden is pushing so hard, not just to go for um, the bipartisan infrastructure package, he's saying, well, I want to remake the economy from an inequality perspective as well. So these are big issues that are impacting monetary and fiscal policy that investors have to be thinking about. Then you look at other social issues that in other parts of the globe are just becoming part of regulation. We've talked a couple of times about labor standards with regards to commodities, but you know, Australia has taken a big stand saying that modern slavery is an issue that just from a regulatory perspective, every investor is going to have to report on and try to figure out where that is um, in its supply chain and how it's investing. And so I think that's just right around the corner that investors are going to have to, in other parts of the world, say, how do I make sure that key social issues as extreme as slavery or child labor are actually addressed in uh, what I'm investing in. And so to me, that's sort of the next frontier that's harder to measure than just looking at carbon mm -hmm. emissions and going to become mm -hmm. critical for investors to think about where it fits into their portfolio.